Thank you very much, everybody, for that lovely welcome. It's really great to be here uh, with you today. What I'm going to do is tell you a story about the last grown-up job that I ever did. And it was the job where I was responsible for hosting the spectators at the London Olympics and Paralympic Games. I sometimes say those words, and I can't quite believe that it was me that was doing that. Um, so I'd like to tell you my story about how we did that and how we managed to get people, most people volunteers, to come to work and use their personalities to deliver service that wasn't just good, but that was really memorable and made the games so special and so memorable. So um, my story starts not at the Olympic Games, but I was working in aviation. So I left school and didn't go to university, didn't go to college. I went to work at 18 for British Airways. And I was working for British Airways, and suddenly this chap popped up on the scene, Richard Branson, someone I'm sure you'll all recognize, and uh, started a company called Virgin Atlantic. And I remember looking out of my window when I was working at British Airways and seeing a big red Virgin Atlantic airplane and thinking to myself, Virgin? What a funny name for an airline. That's not going to last. Um, so I was completely wrong about that. And of course, Virgin is now one of the biggest names in aviation. Uh, several years later, I was lucky enough to get a phone call from him and said, come and le leave the blue team, come and join the red team, and let's make flying fun. Wow, how could you say no to an offer like that? So I left British Airways, and I went to work for Virgin. Now, although I looked very confident, I was really nervous about going to work for a company that was so well known, so iconic. And I was thinking, what can I, what can I bring to this? You know, I'm quite organized. I make sure things happen on time. But what, what really can I add to this brand that's so memorable? And I'd been working for Virgin for a couple of weeks, and I got a letter from a customer and uh, I want to tell you about this letter because it really inspired me to, to become the leader that I, I try to be. So this letter was from a, a chap. That's a, a guy in your language. <laughs> and he was a very frequent business customer. But at the, on the occasion he was writing about, he was traveling in economy, a man with three children under eight. Ladies, can you imagine this? A guy with three children under eight. And he hadn't ordered special meals for the children. So when the food comes round and the choice is chicken curry or vegetable lasagna, the children say, I'm not going to eat that, Dad. That looks revolting. So he's really panicking now. So he pressed the call bell and the crew member arrived and he explains what has happened. Now, at this point, the crew member could have said, oh, what a shame. What a shame you didn't go online yesterday and put in your details. We could have loaded food for the children. She didn't do that. What she actually did was she went to the galley. She found three clean sick bags. She wrote the children's names on the sick bags. She found the cart of food that had been loaded for the flight and cabin crew. She got sandwiches, fruit and sweets, and made up three little picnic bags, served it to the kids. Now, that letter really made me think about that action. That action didn't cost anything, but it really was valuable to the customer. So I phoned this crew member, and I said, thanks so much for what you did. That was a really great thing you did. And she said, Linda, it doesn't matter. I love my job, and I know you've got my back. And that really made me think that great leadership isn't about kind of telling people all the detail of what they need to do. It's about being really clear about what needs to be delivered and then giving people the freedom to go out and have fun with the customers and just do great work. So I loved working at Virgin because it really believed in that stuff. It really believed in collaboration, really believed in giving people freedom. But I'm a Londoner. You can tell, can't you, from the accent. I love London. I was born in London. My family are in London. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm never going to leave London. That's me. Cut it me in the middle. That's what it says, London. 
And in 2003, it was announced that London was going to host the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So I knew I was going to have to be a part of this, and I was going to have to leave my beloved Virgin to do that. So I started to stalk the job boards, and uh, there were lots of jobs for builders and project managers, lots of tech jobs. Finally, there was a job that was all about people. And I thought, this is me. This is, what I, this is what I can do. This is how I can contribute to this Games. So I left Virgin in 2008, four years before the Games was due to happen, and I went and joined the organizing committee of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Now, I want to give you a very quick history lesson. London has hosted the Games twice before, once in 1908 and once in 1948. Now, my daughters say to me, Mum, what were they like? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, 1908, wasn't at either of those, wasn't born for either of those. 1908, uh, you know, nobody remembers that. 1948, known as the Austerity Games. Immediately after the war, there was no money. The athletes had to bring their own food with them. And the people of London were asked if they would host the athletes in their own homes. So I told my girls this story, and they got super excited. We might have Usain Bolt with us in the spare bedroom. But uh, that didn't happen <laughs> either. So I guess the point of telling you the history is... Nobody really remembers how it happened last time because it was such a long time ago, such a different world. And just as I was leaving Virgin and moving to the Games, this came on the TV. You, you all look very young, but I'm sure you, you remember this, the Beijing Games. And we, we watched this on the television at home and we looked at this architecture, looked at the Bird's Nest Stadium, how incredible it looked. Next to it was the great big blue aquatics cube and it just looked fantastic. And we thought in the, in the, in the London Games, wow, what are we going to do? How on earth can we match this? And do you remember the, um, the opening ceremony at the Beijing Games? It was in the Bird's Nest Stadium. The lights came up and there were all those drummers beating absolutely in perfect time with each other. That made the heart race even more. You know, the blood pressure's really going up now. And we were thinking, what can we do? How can we match this? Well, I don't know if you remember the London opening ceremony, but we invited Her Majesty the Queen and James Bond uh, to jump in a helicopter, and the Queen, who was 86 at the time, parachuted out of the helicopter into the stadium for the opening ceremony. She's amazing. She's my hero, how she did that. <laughs> So I guess that really signalled how... She didn't really, by the way. <laughs> Someone's looking really worried. No, she didn't. It was an actor. Um, that really signalled how we were going to run our games. So we weren't going to run our games necessarily in a way that was kind of the most perfect, uh, had, had a huge amount of money thrown into it. We wanted to run our games with personality. We wanted to add fun and personality, and my job was to give, give our volunteers the freedom to just go and have fun with our nine million spectators. So, I was, that, that's a pretty daunting task, isn't it? So, uh, let me tell you how I went about that. So, I, um, people said that the friendliest games ever was the Sydney Games back in 2000. Now, we Brits don't like to be beaten by Australians in anything to do with sport. Well, in anything, actually, let alone anything to do with sport. So I went and asked the team at Sydney, how did you do it? How did you get people to be so brilliant? And they said, and I won't do the accent because it's really poor, they said, OK, look, we'll tell you how we did it, but you won't be able to do as well. Ooh, there's a challenge. <laughs> they said three golden rules to managing volunteers. And um, I just want to go tell you about those, those golden rules because they're so simple. But in my observation, it's something we don't really do very well at work. So golden rule number one is people are happy when they're busy. People like being busy. They like having lots to do. It makes you feel like you're making a really good contribution. So make, we made sure that our volunteers were always, had, you know, always busy, always buzzy. Golden rule number two is about uh, reward and recognition. Now, our reward wasn't money. We gave people small uh, badges. Now, you guys are used to wearing pin badges. We Brits don't wear pin badges. And I remember saying to some of my North Atlantic colleagues, you know, I'm not sure about this badge thing. I'm not sure it's going to work. I was so wrong. 
the Brits really loved wearing their badges, even though they were plastic and said McDonald's on them. They, they were given in a very authentic way, so people absolutely loved them. And the third golden rule was just really about great leadership. So we asked all our team leaders to make sure that they didn't spend all day, you know, running around, doing emails, being on the radio, doing busy tasks. But they walked around the venues, stopped and chatted to the volunteers, asked their names, asked them if they had any great ideas about how we could improve the service. Because in my view, the best ideas for service come from people who work with customers every day. Not from people like me, who kind of, you know, sit in offices with spreadsheets, but people who work with customers every day. And the bit that I added to all that is I feel really passionately that it's a leader's job to be clear about what needs to be delivered, but also very tight about that, but very loose in giving people the freedom to go and do that. And I, 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 I did quite a good job in setting that, in setting that, that scene. Um, let me tell you about some of our wonderful volunteers. We called them games makers because their job was to make the games happen. So that, was, that name wasn't luck. We, we chose that name uh, deliberately. Um, this lady's called Dawn. She, uh, she was a volunteer at the Olympic Games. Before she came and volunteered, uh, she'd been unemployed for a very long time. She struggled uh, to get into, into work. And on the first day of the Games, uh, it rained, because it rains in London. And she was standing outside of the main subway station that led to the Olympic Park. Um, she, she was greeting people, telling them where to go. After an hour, her team leader went and found her and said, come and have a coffee. Come and do something. You know, let's change you around. Come and do something different. And Dawn said, no, leave me here. I love it. So she stayed. Uh, sometimes she was in an umpire's chair. Sometimes she was standing. She stayed for 12 days outside that subway station. She had her big foamy hand on. She high-fived all the kids that came by. She learned to recognize all the flags people were carrying so could she, sh she could shout out, hey, Team USA, good luck. She went home every night and watched the sport on the television, made up rap about what had happened, and then was singing the next morning to people. She's on YouTube. She's brilliant. And what I love about that story is she didn't know she could do that. It's only by being given that freedom and that opportunity that she did not just a good job, but an outstanding job that made the day so memorable for our spectators. Um, these two ladies, they, they gave me slight kind of uh, nervousness all, all the time because part of the great thing about giving people the freedom to do things, sometimes you kind of wonder what they're going to do. Um, so these two ladies were working on the Olympic Park, so they didn't see any sport for the whole period of the Games. They were giving people directions how to get to the different venues. And every day, these two girls would get two white toilet rolls and they'd put them in their little uniform bag and bring them onto the Olympic Park. And we used to say to them, why are you doing that? We provide it. You don't need to bring that. And they said, just you watch. And as the spectators arrived and started to queue up to go into the stadium, these ladies would unravel their white toilet rolls, each hold an end, and they'd get all the kids in the line to have a running race, and then they'd burst through the tape and they give them a little chocolate medal as a reward. Really low in cost, really high in value. And that's what people say made the games so memorable, was all those human interactions. And for me, what was so fantastic about it is I realized, you know, this is what I can do. You know, I'm, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a doctor, but I can give people that freedom to go and enjoy themselves at work. And if people enjoy themselves at work, surprise, surprise, they're really brilliant with customers. And the other thing I learned at the Games is that positivity is infectious. Positivity uh, inspires positivity. So as things started to go well, you know, we're all very worried about what bad things might happen. But as things started to go well, shoulders went back and people started to think, you know, this is really good. We can, we can do this. And so suddenly drivers on the subway were making funny announcements. The police were dressing up. You know, things just happened that weren't normal. 
And I remember three days before the opening ceremony, going on to the Olympic Park just to kind of check everything was in place. And a lot of the uh, our, our armed forces were there to do some of the kind of security work that's so essential. And these guys were really fed up. They'd been deployed at the very last minute. <clears throat> And they had uh, a lot of them had their holiday cancelled. They were camping in a car park. I mean, it was a really rotten gig. But something happened as the spectators arrived and started to say, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. And thank you for what you do. Um, you know, their shoulders went back and the chest went out and they started to wear those little plastic badges as well. So the team just kind of grew and grew. But... Um, it had to come to an end. I couldn't just keep running the Olympics forever. And I remember I was lucky enough to be at the closing ceremony of both games. And I remember the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games. I was standing kind of somewhere in the middle here with a whole bunch of our volunteers. And we watched the closing ceremony. We watched the Spice Girls. Uh, we watched the Who. We watched an amazing, amazing selection of uh, performers. And then finally, the flame went down. And our chairman, uh, Seb Co, stood up. And he did all the thank yous. And he thanked the athletes, he thanked the officials, he thanked the press, he thanked the broadcasters. You know, he thanked, on a, it went on a bit, but he thanked everybody. <laughs> Finally, he said, um, I'd like to thank our volunteers. I'd like to thank our volunteer games makers. And without any planning or any orchestration, 85,000 people in that stadium stood up together and cheered nonstop for 12 minutes. And I can just about tell you that story and keep it together because it was one of the most emotional moments of my life. And certainly those 20 volunteers standing by me, they'd gone by this point. They were in floods of tears because they knew they'd done absolutely the best work of their lives and they were being paid nothing. So when people say, you know, if only we could pay people more, it's all about, you know, a tangible reward, that doesn't kind of do it for me. I think it's all about loving your job, loving your customers, and having that sense of freedom. And with that comes real personality. Thank you very much for listening to my story. <laughs> <laughs>